Okay, this is the practice test one. Um, this is actually spring 2012. Okay. Um, every six months, the U.S. Federal Reserve Board conducts a survey of credit card plans in the U.S. The following data are the interest rates charged by the 10 credit card issuers randomly selected from the January 08 survey. And there's a source. Okay, so look, you know, we kind of glance at that, get a feel for what it's asking, and then compute the mean, median, mode of the sample interest rates. So, obviously, I'm going to have to put that data in to the calculator. So, we press Stat, and we press Edit, and we clear out anything that's in L1. So, if you have data in L1, go ahead and scroll up there and press Clear and Enter. It'll clear everything out in there. If you don't have L1, you can press Stat and Number 5 Setup Editor, and once you press Enter there, then go back in, it should be there. Okay? Alright, so let's go ahead and put this data in. I'll pause the video here. Um, okay, welcome back. I went ahead and put the data in there. You didn't need to see me typing all that in. Okay, so there's our data. We've got 10 data points there. Now compute the mean, median, and mode for the sample of interest rates. So we press STAT, scroll over to CALC, and press ENTER. Make sure you can see that. Okay, and here it is. So our mean is 12.62%. Our, what else is that for? Median, scroll on down. There's our median at 13.6%. And the mode, we can just kind of look at that. Um, with this small data set, it looks like 14.4 comes up the most, so the mode would be 14.4. Now it says to create a histogram of the data set using a class width of 1%. Okay, so we need to turn our histogram on, so press second, y equals, and right now it's set to a box plot. We may do that in a little bit, but let's go ahead and find the histogram now. And it does say L3, I need to put mine in, it lists as L1, and this frequency should be at 1. So you may have to hit alpha or shift to make sure it doesn't. it's not blinking on the alpha when you come down here. So hit alpha and then hit one. Okay, and now we're ready to graph it. So press zoom nine. Now this is a class interval width. Uh, let's press trace. Um, looks like it's at two percent here. So what we're going to do is press window, and the x scaling um, is what changes my bin width. So press one and then press graph. There we go. And so now we're going from 6.5 to 7.5. We have one value in there, none in there, none in there, and then between 9.5 and 10.5 there's one, and you can kind of look here and we have, yep, there it is right there. Okay, so you want to be able to certainly read these histograms. Okay. So on the test I wouldn't ask you necessarily to reproduce this histogram um, but you ought to be able to create one and be able to answer questions, you know, is what sort of shape is this distribution? I don't think this asks this, but what kind of shape is that? Looks skewed to the left, right? Looks skewed to the left. Um, I could do a box plot of this. I don't think this one asks that, but I can certainly do that. So I can press second um, y equals and turn that histogram into this first box plot. And then just press zoom 9. And there's our box plot. So it does appear we have an outlier there. I can press trace, find out what it is. I guess it's at 6.5%, sort of a small outlier there. Okay, there's our Q1, there's our median, Q3, and our max. Okay, uh, part C. Which statistic is least influenced by extreme observation, the mean or median? So the median, right? The median is least influenced by extreme observations. So one thing, I'm not sure if we're going to ask this here in a little bit, but if your data are skewed, like this is skewed, we definitely want to report the median. Um, now sometimes you'll report the mean and the median, but at the very least report the median. Um, if your data is roughly symmetric, um, then you can report the mean. You can certainly report both, but you definitely um, the mean is definitely the one to use there. Okay. So compute the range, sample variance, sample standard deviation, and the interest of the for the interest rates. 
and it says around the nearest tenth of percent. So we can go back in here. We already crunched this out, right? Enter, and so the sample standard deviation would be about 2.6, um, right? Um, in order to find the sample variance, I need to square that. Now, don't square the one you rounded. Go ahead and take this out at least a few places. Um, the way I usually do this is, just so I don't mess it up, I click on VARS and go to number 5. It's a, it's a statistic variable. And then I choose the one I want to square, number 3. And I'm going to square that. So our variance is about 6.7. And then our range, we can just subtract to do that in our head, right? Uh, 4.5 minus 6.5 um, is what? 8. So about 8%. Okay. Okay, so here I do ask about, um, based on the histogram drawn in B, comment on the appropriateness of using the empirical rule. So remember, the empirical rule is only good for what kind of distributions? Right, when they're symmetric and bell-shaped. Um, not only symmetric, but they need to be bell-shaped. So uh, when I go back and look at this histogram again, let me change this back to histogram, and you'll get much better doing this. We'll be doing these this the rest of the semester, so make sure you, you get pretty good at it here. Again, zoom 9. And I can change that if I want to. X scaling. Sometimes it really messes it up, and the X scaling is nowhere close to what it needs to be. Okay, so that looks good enough. And so this is skewed left, so the the empirical rule would not be as, as appropriate here. All right, you could certainly use it, but you'd be off um, a little bit. Okay. Okay, part F. Um, use the population mean and standard deviation to find um, the z-score corresponding to 6.5%. This is the rate offered by the Pulaski Bank and Trust. So this is actually a typo. I don't know if I'll be able to correct it in time for you guys. We should say the sample. I mean, we're not given the population mean and standard deviation, I don't believe. So um, our sample mean, which we've already reported earlier, was 12.62. Was so let me try to get this little pin here. So this was the sample mean, x bar. The sample standard deviation was, I think we used 2.6. Probably should have gone another decimal out here. I don't know why I told you to round to the nearest tenth. Because um, our data is to the nearest tenth, so usually we go out another place on that. Out of the nearest tenth. I'm not sure why I would have done that. So let me look at that again. I may need to change that direction there. So we have stat, calc, one variable statistic. Let's take that out a little bit more. So let's say 2.59. Um, I don't think it'll make that much of a difference. I mean, I wouldn't count off for something like this, but okay. And we can probably report the mean as 12.6. So now we need to find the z-score corresponding with 6.5. So again, the z is going to be 6.5 minus 12.6 divided by the 2.59. So we just do 6.5 minus 12.6 press enter, and then divide it by 2.59. And we get negative 2.36. Okay, so you need to be able to compute a z-score without a whole lot of trouble. Um, sometimes students, when, they'll, when they put that 6.5 minus 12.6, they'll do it like this. They'll say 6.5 minus 12.6, and then they'll go ahead and divide it by here. Now, remember why that's wrong is what of operations. If I did that, I'm only dividing the 12.6 by 2.5. If I wanted to do it all in one line, I would need to put parentheses, right? I would need to stick a paren here and then a paren here. 
and then I'd get it. Oop, um, I should have said 2.59. 0.59. There we go. Okay. Okay, we're going to do something very similar on part G here. Um, use sample mean and standard deviation. Again, that should say sample, not population, to find the z-score corresponding to 14.5%, the rate offered at Bar Harbor Trust. So, so this one is 2.35 standard deviations below the mean. Um, so we're going to do parentheses 14.5. I'm assuming you can write that formula down. 14.5 minus the 12.6 divided by 2.59. And we get about 0.73. Point 0.73. Okay, fine. The first quartile, we've already done this, right? Um, we did the one bar stat. We got a first quartile here at 12. Find the inner quartile range. So find the inner quartile range. In fact, there's a five number summary. I think I asked for that a little bit later. Um, we just do Q3 minus Q1, which is going to be what? 2.4. And then part J, five number summary. It's all right there. So 6.5, 12, 13.6, 14.4, 14.5. .6, 14 now to find your fences, remember that formula for that. So the lower is 1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. Upper is Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. So we need, definitely need to be able to use formula. We don't use the formula a whole lot in here, believe it or not. We're going to be using the calculator for most of these, but this one's not bad, right? So you can just do Q1, which we found to be 12. So we're going to say 12 minus 1.5 times the IQR we just found, which was the difference of those two, times 2.4. So the lower fence is here at 8.4. And what would the upper fence be? Be Q3, which is 14.4, plus 1.5, times the IQR, which was, again, 2.4. And hopefully you see where I'm getting those numbers. 18. So there's my lower fence. So do I have anything lower than 8.4? I do, right? I've got that 6.5. So that is an outlier, and I don't have anything above 18. If I did, that would be an outlier. Now you notice if I do a box plot, and I think you may have noticed that when I did one earlier, second y equals. Let's go ahead and change that histogram to a box plot. And I don't want to do the one with the outliers. If I don't choose the one with the outliers, I won't see the outliers. Let's do zoom 9. There's that outlier. Now, unfortunately, the this formula doesn't always correspond to this. It, it usually will, but sometimes if it's on the edge. Um, I'm not sure what formula the calculator uses. Different programs use different formulas. Um, so if I scroll on out here, you'll see it's 6.5, and it is definitely an outlier. You can look at the data set and see that's certainly much lower than anything else. Everything else is sort of between, what, 12 and 14 and a half or so. Okay, and so we've drawn a box plot, determine the shape of the distribution, and confirm with the histogram. So this is definitely skewed to the left, right? And we've seen the histogram already. Um, there's my hist. Whoop, let me do a zoom 9. There we go. And again, change my window back to X scaling, make that a 1. There we go. Okay. Okay, number two, putting it together, paternal smoking. So I'll let you read through that. We have two, we have non-smoking um, fathers and smoking fathers here. So is this an observational study or a designed experiment? Hopefully, see, this is obviously an observational study. Um, can you think of any ethical concerns you would have if it were a designed experiment? Well, yeah. I mean, you can't impose smoking on fathers, right? You can't say, you guys are going to smoke a pack a day, you guys two packs a day, you guys none a day. Um, that would be certainly unethical. So we, we can't always have designed experiments. Okay, so the explanatory variable is going to be what? It's going to be whether the father smoked or not. So that's what you put there. And what kind of variable is this? This is going to be a categorical. So again, explanatory is whether the father smoked or not. 
and obviously a categorical is either yes or no. Um, response variable is going to be what? Birth weight, right? That's what we're measuring. And what kind of type is that? If you look up here, these are all numbers, and the, I, adding and subtracting these makes sense, so this is quantitative. Calculate the five number summary. Okay, so we get the data typed in, and yes, it does take a few minutes to type that in, but you know, three or four minutes typing that in is not that big a deal. Um, so now we're going to go to stat, calc, one variable statistic, and let's go ahead and do um, the first one. I think I put my non smokers in at one. Okay, and so it's looking for the five number summary here. So we need to scroll on down. So there it is. There's the minimum, 2976. There's Q1, 3436. There's the median, which is Q2, 3693.5. And here's Q3 at 3976, and the max, 4354. Do the same thing for the um, smokers. So again, stat, calc, enter. So this time when you do it, you got to make sure you say L2, otherwise you're going to find the same statistics. And again, so there's the mean if we need that a little bit later on. And there's our five number summary. And then actually ask for that on the next one, right? So you can write down, this is the smokers. We got the mean of 3460.4. And the sample standard deviation is at 452.6. And we can go and do the non smokers. Let's see, stat, calc, one variable, L1. There you go. And scroll on down. There's the mean, and there's the um, standard deviation. And again, the sample standard deviation is the SX. If it says population, it's this sigma X. Okay, draw box plots on the same grid. Okay, so I don't know if we've done this yet. So we're going to go to um, second Y equals, and right now one, but one plot is on. Let's go ahead and change that to a box plot with the outliers. Okay, and that's the L1, frequency 1, that's fine. But I need, now need to go in back there again, second Y equals, and go to number 2. See, right now that second plot is off. Press Enter, and let's go ahead and turn that on, and press the other box plot. This time my X list is in L2. Does that make sense? So we did L1 for box plot 1, and the list in L2 for box plot 2. Frequency needs to be 1, so now press zoom 9. And now we have one box plot on top of the other. So this first one's the non smokers I can trace. So there's my non smokers in L1. And then scroll down, and there's my smokers in L2. And so we can see visually that the, um, the smokers have a smaller weight, right? It's a nice visual representation of the, um, the five number summary. Okay, so does the box plot confirm the conclusion of the study? Yes, it does. Non-smokers um, are shipped to the right. The median is higher as well. Create a histogram for the non-smoking group and comment on the shape. Um, I'm going to draw just sort of use the TI to do this. So non-smoking group, I believe, was L1, right? So we're going to go to stat, or sorry, second Y equals, and let's make that, rather than a box plot, make it a histogram. But I need to turn off that second stop plot, or else I'll have a two box plots on top of a box plot on top of a histogram, which I don't want. Okay, then do a zoom nine. That looks pretty. It's hard to get better than that for a nice normal distribution. So yes, it's normally distributed, uh, and we can use the empirical rule when it's normally distributed, right? And which measure or central tendency do we usually like if we're normally distributed? Good, the mean. Um, if you can use the empirical rule, and we can. Um, use it to determine the percent of infants that would fall between 33.10 and 40.22. So again, we would need to draw out um, the scale here. So there's our scale drawn out. So I always draw out the mean right there. We, can, we could pencil in standard deviation below if we wanted to. And between 33.10, which is right here, and 40.22, 
we're going to have 68% of that. That's, that's one standard deviation from the mean, right? That would be filled in right there. And maybe I can, I'm not sure if this is worth it, but. So we're going to be, we're looking right here to right here. And so that part is 68% from one standard deviation. If it had said between 29.54 and 43.78, that'd be 95%, right? And we should be able to kind of subtract out to get just that little part as well. So now determine the actual number that fell between 33.10 and 40.22. So how does this compare with the empirical rule? So we go up there and count how many actually fell within between 33.10 and 40.22. Um, just sort of, it, it's a sort of a tedious exercise, right, to have to count all those. If I were doing this, and I did do this, I would sort it out. So I would take my data and um, go to sort ascending. And I would sort um, non-smokers on L1, right? Okay. And now when I go back to my list, they're all sorted for me. So I just kind of find uh, how many fell between after 3310. So we'd start right here with 3423 and then count how many are up until we get to 4022. Right? So we're going from, you can see this This is the seventh data point. We go all the way to right there, right? So we, that we end up getting 19. So 19 fell between those two values, which is 63%. So 19 divided by the total number. And that's pretty close to the empirical rule, relatively close. So can we say the father smoking causes low birth weight? So really remember this. Um, most of you were getting this really well when we were, that's all we were doing, but now that we sort of tag it on as an extra question, uh, make sure you get that. This is an observational study. So we cannot draw a cause and effect. I mean, maybe fathers who, who smoke also have other problems, or they you know, lower SES, or all things like that. So there are ways to control for stuff like that, but we're not, we're not told that in the study. So we cannot um, have a cause and effect conclusion here. And that's it. So I hope that helps going through. Don't know if we'll have time to go through all that during class. So um, that's it. Good luck on the test. I'd print this out again, work it through again as if you were doing it from scratch. Don't just look at what you've done or look what I've done, even worse. Um, and go through the multiple choice part as well.